Hello, and welcome to the New Lines podcast, where we delve into some of the biggest ideas, events, and personalities in the Middle East and beyond. Today's episode is part of the magazine's new series focusing on histories and philosophies. I'm Kevin Blankenship. Joining me today is Marcel Kuperzhoek, a former Dutch diplomat in Egypt, where he did his PhD on modern Egyptian literature, as well as in Syria and Saudi Arabia. He served as Netherlands ambassador in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkey, and Poland, and as Dutch special representative for Syria based in Istanbul. He's also an accomplished scholar and translator of Nebelti Bedouin poetry. Based on field work begun in 1989, Marcel has recorded oral poems from Central Arabia at the edge of the empty quarter and published them in five volumes of translations and glossaries. Since 2015, he's been a senior research fellow at New York University Abu Dhabi, where he has published three more editions and translations of Nabati poems. The most recent is Love, Death, Fame, out this year from the Library of Arabic Literature at NYU Press. It's the first ever edition and translation of poems by al mayadi ibn Dahir, a 17th century figure considered the father of Emirati poetry and culture. Marcel has written about his work for the English language daily Abu Dhabi newspaper, The National, and has designed and hosted two TV documentary series on Bedouin culture and poetry in Arabia with Al Arabiya TV Dubai, The Last Traveler, based on his book, The Last Bedouin, and Monuments of Poetry. Both documentaries are in Arabic. In 2019, he produced two documentaries on Emirati poetry with Abu Dhabi TV. Hi, Marcel. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Hello, Kevin. Thank you for uh, having me. <laughs> Uh, it's hard to know where to begin. You've done so much in uh, in a relatively short period of time. Before we talk about your translations of Nabati poetry, I wanted to step back for a second and ask about your background. One thing that strikes me is how you blend history and culture from hundreds of years ago with current trends in literature, society, and even politics. Um, for me, it's rare to see someone wear two hats. One is a diplomat, someone involved in, in political affairs, and the other as a scholar stepping back to take a long view of history and culture. How do you personally strike that balance and what's kept you coming back to Bedouin culture over the years? <laughs> well, I, didn't th I don't think I, I struck any balance. It just uh, happened more or less. Um, <laughs> uh, I studied Arabic in uh, the Netherlands where I'm living now in Amsterdam. And uh, I studied in Leiden uh, University which has a very old tradition of Arabic scholarship. Um, so during my uh, studies there, I went for a year to Egypt and uh, I was living in the um, Medina del Gemariya, the, uh, mm. the student dorms. <laughs> uh, and actually all my fellow students there, they came from uh, Upper Egypt because those who lived in Cairo, they just stayed with their parents. So we were also always together in the, in the weekend. So maybe there, <laughs> because most of the Bedouins, they... You know, they always say that Upper Egypt has more of the Bedouins than uh, than uh, than Lower Egypt. So perhaps it right. started there. And then when I finished my studies, um, the Netherlands, together with the United States, were singled out for an oil boycott by the um, Arab states in connection with the uh, October War, 1973. And we wanted to explain, as the Netherlands, that we didn't deserve that. You know, so they wanted to do some uh, lobbying in Arab capitals, but they did not have no one who, who spoke Arabic in the service. So they needed some uh, Arabist. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just had finished my studies and I was recruited. And uh, I said, OK, as long as my uh, first posting can be Cairo, because I wanted to do my PhD there. So uh, th then it started. And since then, uh, the two have been going uh, hand in hand, rather smoothly. Um, so I would say that they have been more or less, as we used to say as diplomats, uh, mutually reinforcing uh, mm. one, one, one the other. So it's, it's not that, um, I, I think I, I benefited a lot of it, especially when I came to Saudi Arabia and wanted to start my studies of the uh, Bedouin in the desert and uh, having been there, Four years. It was not easy to enter the country in that uh, time. You know, uh, if you wrote a letter to the government saying I want to do field work in Saudi Arabia, probably got no response at all. Huh. So, yeah. uh, having lived there, <laughs> you know, I knew the, uh, of course, the foreign ministry and how to do things. And 
I, I had built my network and so on. <clears throat> now, how long was it after you had been studying in Egypt that you first went to the Gulf? Um, well, pretty long, actually, because uh, the first time I went to the Gulf was um, in, well, actually, I went to Yemen once when I was posted in Egypt because um, South Yemen, then at that time, it was still North Yemen and South Yemen. And from Cairo, we had a co-accreditation in uh, Aden, South Yemen. So once I had to uh, go there and fly there, so that was my, but that's not really the Gulf or so, that's, that's the Arabian Peninsula. Right. So my first time in the Gulf was when I arrived in Saudi Arabia uh, uh, for my job as uh, the, the, the deputy chief of mission there. Uh, that was in 1985, I think. And of and course, then uh, if you're in the, in the middle of Saudi Arabia and Riyadh, you know, you're not really in the Gulf. <laughs> right. Know, it's, a long, it's a long way from the water. Uh, and uh, it's in the country called Nejd, traditionally, which is Central Arabia. It has a, a character all its own. <clears throat> yeah, this is a, a great segue into our, our sort of main topic of the, the episode, which is that yeah. speaking of your long interest in Bedouin culture, you've spent years among the Bedouin doing field work uh, in the Gulf and Central Arabia. And I appreciate the distinction you just made between those, those two regions. Uh, and, and you've recorded their oral poems and studied their culture. These are topics of, as you know, major importance to national and cultural identity for countries in that region like the UAE. And yet you're a so-called outsider. I'm using scare quotes here. Someone not born and raised in these traditions that you study. It's striking to me that these, these tribes and others from the region would have given you access that you've enjoyed over the years. Could you say more about how you came to Nabalti poetry and culture as a, again, quote unquote, outsider? and your interactions with that culture as a living phenomenon? Well, uh, before I went to uh, Saudi Arabia, I was posted in New York, actually, at the uh, Netherlands mission to the United Nations. And uh, after that delightful period, I managed to persuade my wife to come with me to Riyadh, <laughs> which she <laughs> kindly uh, assented to. And uh, But my first plan was to start and breed camels because uh, I like the desert, I've always liked the desert and uh, interested in camels and travels through the desert on camels that and is, so on. But, that is yeah. fascinating. I hate to interrupt you, but did you get anywhere with that? Did you actually, did you have camels and did you start breeding? No, I, I did some camel riding, but um, I found out that it was a bit too um, too arduous and I got interested on the way by to, um, to to study the, the Bedouin poetry as soon as I opened newspapers in uh, Riyadh, which was my job to um, make, a, make a daily summary of the um, Saudi newspapers for the ambassador. Uh, I always saw those pages with the poetry. And of course, I knew classical Arabic. And um, so these poems, they look suspiciously like uh, ancient Arabic poetry, but I couldn't quite understand it. You know, so mm -hmm. I thought that was an interesting topic. And then I learned that the only way to, 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 to really understand those poems in that language was to, there were no, 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 no manuals for it. There were no books for it, you know? So you had to go to the people and learn it from them. And uh, I had the fort good fortune to meet one um, very eminent scholar in this field, probably the, the, the greatest expert, Dr. Saad Soyan, who was then um, teaching anthropology at King South University. And he wrote a book uh, by which, which was published exactly at that time, Nabati Poetry, um, the poetry of um, of Arabia. So, um, oh, what time would this? What year would this have been approximately? 80, 85, something like that. Yeah, okay. eighty-five, eighty-six. Um, so, you know, we started to uh, be in touch, and I read what I could find, and I went to bookshops that sold um, old diwans and so on. And um, I started striking up acquaintances and traveling around the country, uh, especially towards the northern part of Saudi Arabia. You know, Saudi Arabia is a big, it's a big place. You know, I was, it has the size of the United States uh, to, the, to, the, to the east of the Mississippi. I think that always gives you a good idea. So, mm. You know, you could go to places like uh, more than a thousand miles apart and still be with the Bedouin, the different tribes. Wow. So first I went to the north uh, direction of Syria and Jordan and the Nafud Desert. Uh, 
But Dan uh, Saad himself, he concentrated on that area and he was recording hundreds of hours with, with, with poets and transmitters. So uh, very few people had written about the tribes in the central or, or center of Nejd, that is between Riyadh and Mecca, and in the southern Nejd, Wadi Dawasr, direction of Yemen. So I, I prepared myself to go there, and at the end of my stay, I drew up a plan, a uh, proposal for, for research and, uh, in Arabic, and I sent it to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to get permission for four days, four months, um, going into, into the field with my uh, old uh, Land Rover with a tent on the roof. <laughs> and um, then uh, <laughs> the letter was sent to, sent to the royal court, and eventually it had to be decided by uh, the king then, King Fahad himself. And also um, the deputy governor of Riyadh province, who was then the governor was uh, the present King Salman. And of course, the practical work was done by someone else, uh, the wakil. Although mm -hmm. his father uh, had already done very interesting research. For instance, in his books, I found the exact location of the places mentioned in the first verse, the famous, most famous verse in uh, ancient Arabic poetry of uh, Imul Kais. Wow. You know, uh, uh, when I was at university, no one bothered about these names. So I found it strange. The most famous verse in Arabic poetry, and the half of it was about place names no one knew about. And the commentary said, well, these are places in the desert. Fine. Uh, <laughs> but the Bedouin, they still knew them. <laughs> so I saw that in the book. So one of the... Uh, I went there with my Land Rover and I had a, an escort because otherwise I would be lost in those huge deserts of the, uh, what they call the desert police. So I got a lot of, uh, because of the king's permission, and then it went down to the deputy government of the, gov of the province of Riyadh, you know, which is almost half of Saudi Arabia. And that man is so powerful and he gave me a letter of recommendation. And then I could go wherever I wanted, you know, everyone... Uh, uh, invited me and I could stay with them and they would spend time with me and they would slaughter sheep and invite guests and, and so on and so on. Wow. So actually it was very um, easy and you said, Who can you do? how can you do those both jobs, diplomat and an Arabist? But if you're doing field work in such a place, I mean, you couldn't have done without one, without the other, I think, actually, you know. And so once, once things get going and, and uh, you know people and you publish and they know what you're doing and the people themselves they were incredibly hospitable and uh, enthusiastic you know because as you mentioned earlier this is their real culture their right. real culture at that time was oral culture and to a very large extent of course they always speak about their uh, their ancestors their father and grandfathers great grandfathers great uncles and so on because that's a source of pride uh, to them Absolutely. Uh, so they, they, they were most eager. Of course, I mean, the poetry and the stories you get are biased in favor of their tribe. You, know? <laughs> you can always go to the other tribe and ask their story. And, uh, <laughs> right. Compare the two. So right. um, then, then things went, went smoothly and I ended up in uh, Wadi de Water in the far south. And there I met what, you know, I think I always call him the last Bedouin. It was uh, Abdin Dan, his name, uh, and that was the first book I published when I when I came back, the poetry of Abdin Dan. He was uh, illiterate, but he was a fantastic poet. He used all the classical meters uh, already from pre-Islamic times and so much of his vocabulary and um, uh, prosody, you know, it, it had changed a bit, of course, but still was recognizable and original as well. Wow. There, there are so many things, just even just listening to you talk, there's so many things I want to ask you. Um, and, and unfortunately we don't have time for them all, but just, this brings up so many, you know, thoughts and questions in my mind. You were just mentioning, you know, the, the vocabulary of this poetry, um, and meter and other things like that. Um, and again, I wanted to step back just briefly. I'm sure many listeners have heard of the Millions Poet Competition, which has brought Bedouin Nubalti poetry to worldwide audiences in the last 20 years. But 
recognizing that some people might not know about this poetic tradition, I wanted to ask, what is Nabati poetry, Marcel? Where does it come from? And what are some of its core characteristics? And also, what's its role in Gulf and Arabian society, both through history and still today? Yeah, well, Nabati poetry is uh, one of the names given and, and, and by, by the people themselves there. And of course, Nabati, it, um, it brings associations with the Nabateans, uh, the, 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 the people who mm. live there and uh, are known from the monuments in uh, Petra and in uh, Maidan Saleh in, in, in Saudi Arabia. And, and of course, they themselves were influenced by the Romans and so on. So it, it, in, in that sense, it could mean um, a very old poetry, but in a language that is not entirely uh, correct Arabic, let's say, or, you know, classical Arabic. So that's one uh, explanation. Another is that sometimes the people um, in Iraq uh, at the rivers, the, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and the Al Jazeera, they call it the island between the two rivers, and they call it the Sawad, you know, the black ground because mm -hmm. there are so many palm trees and so on. So these people, the Arabs found there, they, they, they are sometimes called Anbah. But I think both explanations are dubious. And uh, so the, 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 the fact is that um, this was all research by Saeed Sawayan that we, re, we, we, we cannot be sure and we really don't know. But what it means in effect is that it is a, a poetry which is not uh, composed according to the rules of uh, Khalil, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the man who, who invented <laughs> or our dear Khalil the Arabic uh, language and prosody. Um, but I think, in my mind, um, uh, this is also the book which was just uh, published, uh, went into that. Uh, it is just Arabian poetry, uh, poetry of the Arabian Peninsula, which I mean, the Arabian language comes from the Arabian Peninsula, right? And the Arabian poetry, the oldest poetry we know, is also from the Arabian uh, Peninsula and the tribes there and Tamim and Assad and Batafan and so on. So uh, from there, it spread to, to what is now the Arab world. Yeah, what's, what's the, uh, the earliest date, approximately, that we can say, you know, we have evidence of what is recognizably Nabalti poetry as we know it today? Or are, are we able to say? Well, it's, 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 it's much earlier than you would think. So the earliest poem that was identified in the manuscripts, which have been preserved by, 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 by Sawayan, and uh, I talk about that in this new book, is from the uh, 13th century, 1200 something, you know. And then even Khaldun, he mentions examples, the famous historian from uh, Tunisia. Uh, from, he, he mentioned uh, Banu Elal. You know, the, 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 the Banu Elal, that's a famous um, legend, probably based on, on reality, who went in the, in the year 1000 or the, the 11th century, 10th century, uh, first from the Arabian Peninsula to Egypt. And from there, uh, they were sent by the, um, by the Fatimids <laughs> <laughs> towards the west, towards uh, Tunisia and Algeria and those areas. Um, so that's based on, 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 on history, but it, it grew into a legend, which is also famous in Arabia itself. And in Egypt, you have the, um, the, the epic, uh, the storytellers and in Syria and so on. So Ibn Khaldun mentions these examples of this early poetry in his al Muqaddima, you know, the, the prologue, uh, uh, Prolegomena to, um, his historical work. And he, the, the examples he gives on, of them are very close to some of the poems in this uh, in this Emirati book uh, I mentioned. So actually, I th to make things a little bit simple, uh, in my mind, the, the last real Bedouin poet uh, was uh, Zul Rumma. You know, he lived up mm. to the year um, 800, you could say. And of course, he was in touch with the Abbas, Abbasid centers in, 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 in Basra and Baghdad and Kufa and so on. Uh, and then there is like, you could say, a gap of 400 years. And then uh, Nabati poetry emerges in the 13th century. And from there, we have a continuous line until today, you could say. So right. um, 
I mean, it hardly can be other, also because the modern Bedouin poetry, or let's say pre oral Bedouin poetry, it so much resembles um, even pre Islamic poetry from the Arabian Peninsula uh, that the tradition has been preserved uh, orally and continued and very slowly evolved and developed. But it's, it's a, a straightforward outgrowth from, from there. Yeah. Uh, in one of your books, Arabian Satire, and this is an addition and translation of the poetry of Hamedan Shuayar, who lived in the Nejd region, which you mentioned previously, uh, in the 18th century. And in the introduction, you say that the towns of that region in that era can be compared to ancient Greek or medieval Italian city-states, each with its own ruling classes in perpetual competition. This is a time, Marcel, in Gulf history that people tend to overlook. I'm sure you're aware of this. When people study the 17th to the 19th centuries in the Islamic world, they tend to focus on Ottoman and Safavid lands. Can you say more about the social and political environment of the poetry and oral traditions you've studied? Well, I think this, um, this is a, a, a projection backwards from how we look at things now, you know, because you compare Ottoman and Safavid. Um, maybe you think of it then like modern states or something, but hmm. the fact of the matter was, you know, I, 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 I told you how big the country is. Uh, you're talking about thousand miles in one direction, other thousand miles in the other direction. Uh, you know, the, the majority of places were not really under any kind of government control. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and that was even true in the 19th century. You know, when you had the Ibn Rashid dynasty in the north of Saudi Arabia. And um, um, so the, the, the culture could just continued as it was. And, and tribes, and so they were very much a law unto themselves. Um, so, um, and you had these small oasis towns. And as you mentioned in the time of Hamedan al who was really a villager or a, a townsperson, he, he hated the Bedouin, actually. <laughs> so, uh, um, there was the, the, this divide was, 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 was quite sharp already there, but of course there's also a lot of symbiosis between both groups. And then only in, in when was it, 1754 or so, uh, the first Saudi state emerged. And their project from the, from the very outset was to, uh, to, to uh, tame the Bedouins, you know, to bring the Bedouins in line with their, um, with, with the conventions and with the laws and the Sharia, mm. and the, the Islamic uh, doctrines um, of the of the towns and and, and villages. But that pro that took a long time, you know. I mean, the first Saudi, Saudi state started then, and then it uh, was destroyed by the Turks in 1811, and then uh, the second Saudi state came and. They were destroyed by the uh, Ibn Rashid and Hayal. And then only in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, they came back to found their, uh, their new third state. And then, of course, they had the good fortune that oil was, uh, was, was, was found. And they, they had enough resources to, <laughs> to complete their project of uh, uh, subjection of the, of the Bedouin, which would have happened anyway, in any case, of course. Right. But, um, so, yeah. Um, in in the uh, you just mentioned this distinction between you know uh, a figure like Hamedan Ashoyer, uh, who was was I guess uh, you, like you said didn't didn't like the Bedouin um, and perhaps other poets who represented Bedouin traditions. Can you um, distinguish a little bit more between those two, or like maybe point out some of the differences? Is there a, you know one tradition that's that's come from people like Hamedan Ashoyer, and then another from, from other figures who might have been more entrenched in Bedouin tribes? Um, I think, you know, what, what we know about those times, um, two centuries ago and, and even more, it comes from, uh, from manuscripts. Uh, uh, oral tradition and, and uh, transmission does not extend that, that far backward. I mean, you know, I think that yeah. the maximum reach of oral um, memory in a, any kind of reliable form is um, maybe 150 years or so, not, mm. not that much. So the, 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 this is a scriptural uh, culture. 
uh, in the towns yeah. there were people who could read and write and especially uh, the imams and the khatib uh, who worked in the mosque and had had some training so logically uh, poets in, in in the towns and, and uh, villages they were if they were good enough or interesting enough they were recorded mm -hmm. uh, but not the Bedouin you know not not so much so because they were outside the scope of the uh, scribes <laughs> and right. uh, the, the literal culture so actually now I'm working on on, on real Bedouin uh, poets and that is mostly well, 90% based on uh, oral tradition itself, uh, you know, recordings we have made from right. people who were very old, <laughs> like <laughs> 90 years, uh, 40 years ago. So they have Incredible. been in touch themselves with um, um, with poets and their uh, and their close family. Yeah, I was going to say that's where people like you come in, Marcel. You know, being able to get out and and record these oral traditions of the Bedouin that uh, for which we don't really have that many records. Um, yeah. And I'll and I'll come back to ask you about your more recent work um, in a minute, but uh, speaking of projects that you've been doing recently, your your most recent book is Love, Death, Fame, which I want to remind listeners is out this year from the Library of Arabic Literature at NYU Press. This is the first edition and translation of the poetry Al Mayadi Ibn Dhahir. Who is Ibn Dhahir, Marcel? What do we know about him? His life, if anything, and and what is his poetry like, both in terms of the language itself and also the themes he writes about? Well, as you mentioned, we, uh, we don't know very much about him as a person, actually next to nothing. So we can only um, try to deduct who he was and when he lived and um, where he inherited his, uh, his art and his, uh, uh, the conventions he built on. And um, in the, um, in his poetry, we only have one mention of a, of a ruler whose um, dates we know, you know, the, of his reign, who was uh, Saif ibn Sultan of the uh, dynasty of the Ya'arubi or Ya'ariba in the plural, hmm. um, who ruled in um, Oman uh, before the uh, accession of the present. Um, uh, dynasty of uh, um, Sultan Qaboos and his successor and so on. So this was in um, this we can date towards the end of the 17th uh, century. So we must assume that he he flourished uh, then. And he also mentioned one other name in his poetry, which is um, Banu Hilal again. Hmm. But um, it's not possible that it's the same Banu Elal that Ibn Khaldun mentioned and that went to uh, North Africa because the Banu Elal never went east towards the, um, the Gulf. Right. But there is a very plausible explanation for that because before the Ya'ariba, there was another dynasty in Eastern Arabia and those were the Jabrits who were there in the 15th century and they were displaced or um, destroyed by the Portuguese, you know, when the Portuguese entered uh, the Gulf and uh, mm. took Bahrain. Um, they put an end to that dynasty in uh, actually in collaboration with the Ottoman uh, governor mm. in Iraq. Um, but this Jabrit dynasty had a branch which survived in what is now the Emirates. So, um, you know, uh, actually the, the, the current Emirates, it used to be considered part of the cultural region of uh, Oman, you know, or in the time of the British um, uh, colonial rule there, it was, it was called the Trucial States, or it's called the northern shore of, of Oman. That's what is, what is now the Emirates. And um, so that branch of the Jabrits continued there until 16... 45 and the Jabrits, they were true Bedouins <laughs> because mm. as, as Bedouins, they, you know, because we know from source, for instance, they used to go uh, hunting um, with falcons, of course, but also with cheetahs. They still were hunting with ah. cheetahs in, in those days. And um, 
in the in the in the in the winter they were in the sands of Dahna, and in uh, in the summer they went to the oases of Al Ahsan. Um, so this Banu Hilal was a branch of the Jabrit, and Ibn Zahir mentions them romantically. You know, uh, yeah. As Ibn Subayl, uh, the 19th century poet of my book, Arabian Romantic, that uh, looking with nostalgia at the, at the Bedouin when they come to the wells of his village, and especially the beautiful Bedouin girls, you know, mm. who were so much more free than the women locked up in mud huts in their own, in his own village. Wow. Um, so attractive. And then, you know, he would say, uh, Rabbi Galbi, so the spring of my heart is the arrival of the Bedouins. But actually, that that was <laughs> the summer. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so the drought for his heart, of the, the, the bad time for his heart, was when they left in September, which is after the harvest of the dates, uh, because the Bedouins, they stuck up, stuck up in dates, and then they depart. So Ibn Zahir, he talks about the Banu Hilal with their cheetahs and tents made of uh, red leather, and they are beautiful girls, and then a huge camel is brought, and on top of the camel they put a hodach, you know, the the, the litter, the mm. chair for the, for the women, and his beloved is put there, put there, and she there off they ride. So he admires them, he longs for them, he's in love with them, um, but in his poetry, of course, it has a acquired a completely different meaning because it's all metaphorical. He was more of a philosopher actually or perhaps right. even a, a sufi um gentle mystic <laughs> a little bit you know we we are no longer in Nech there eh? we are on the coast of uh of the gulf um where they have undergone the influence from uh from india from persia uh, and all those places while inside Nech it's really insular so that's the difference you see yeah. um so, but he was very much influenced by the poetry of the Jabrit period because we don't have the poetry of the Jabrit who were Bedouin, but we do have a lot of poetry sent to the Jabrit by Najdi poets in places like Al Qasim and Arnaiza and uh, other towns in Al, Al, Al Yamama because obviously they were um, like, uh, you know, patrons of, of the poets. They would reward them. And they, they would have a good time at their court and so on. So right. that poetry has been preserved. And even uh, it traveled to where Ibn Zahir was in, the, in, the, in, in what is now the Emirates and what was then called Oman. And uh, some of that poetry and of the, the real Banu Hilal poetry is also found in his verses. Because sometimes these verses travel, they get incorporated in other uh poets uh poets uh, verses even if they are a thousand miles away you know it's like the verses they go like um like leaves on the wind you know they are or, mm. they, they are blown around <laughs> and they <laughs> land everywhere and they influence people so you could say he was really influenced by the uh, by the Nechdi poetry especially of the variant of eastern um, arabia and with some Sufi influences, and there's actually one of his verses, uh, some of his verses incorporate all of these uh, elements. Wow. The Bedouin girls of the Sufi, and he compares them to uh, uh, palm trees when they are swept by the winds, which bring the rains, to uh, Sufi worshippers uh, swinging to and fro and uh, bending towards each other like the, the branches of palm trees in the wind. <laughs> I love so, it. And then from there, he comes, okay, now we talk about Sufi and then palm trees. And then uh, the palm trees, they have huge clusters of dates. And the, the huge clusters of dates, they are black like ravens. And they are compared to the hair of the beautiful Bedouin girl who just departed on that camel, having stocked up on, on dates. And then, you know, you're into a little case already also. Yeah. Compared, um, the the, 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 the the camels uh, leaving uh, with the tribe and the caravan carrying the Bedouin beauties. Right. Uh, you also compare them to, to the, their, because they were swaying, you know, if a camel walks, uh, 
uh, and I know how they walk. I've seen it, you know. That's right. Chair, That's right. Going to and fro. Uh, they, they look like palm trees, you know, seen from a distance. And the beautiful hair of the ladies, the black hair flowing down, you know, they are like the clusters of black dates when they arrive. Yeah. It's just, it's a fascinating association of images. And like you said, you know, speaking of clusters, just a cluster of, of different associations. Um, yeah. If we can zoom out a bit, in your introduction to love, death, fame, Marcel, you write that Sheikh Zayed is known as the father of the nation, meaning the nation of the United Arab Emirates. And it's interesting, you were just talking about how, you know, this, this poetry that Ibn Zahir represents, you know, for a long time, people associated it with Oman, but it seems to stop at the border of the UAE and Oman and, and actually has more to do with these Nejdi traditions that you, you're talking about. And that you say that Ibn Zahid is considered the poet who sort of epitomizes an oral culture that antedates the state by almost three centuries. He also mentioned that for some people, Ibn Zahir's work is proof that the Emirates, far from being a fortuitous creation, as you put it, are largely congruous with pre-existing characteristics. Can you say more about that and 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 whether this is whether that's true? Yes. Um, so um, he was first published in um, in the Emirates in 1963. That happened in Dubai under the auspices of uh, Sheikh Maktoum, the, the 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 ruler, the Emir of uh, Dubai, and actually it appeared. Uh, I have it here uh, in what's called Al Matpa Al Omaniya. <laughs> so that was <laughs> in Dubai at that time. It was still normal to say, you know. And uh, Ibn Zahir was was himself introduced uh, in that um, as um, a, a, po uh, a poet from Oman, because maybe he was just born just uh, across the border. Um, but very close to well, where Al Ain is uh, uh, at the moment, and of course he is he is revered because he is really a truly great um, poet. But he can be also reliably associated with the territory of of, of the Emirates. This is a very young country, huh? mm. after all. I mean, you know, it, it was created in the 1970 from uh, a number of uh, disparate um, Emirates. But all these places. In, in, in his longest poem, he's famous for his range sections. So no, you know, at a certain point yeah. in his poems, which run to uh, to, to about eighty verses sometimes, um, he mentions the places on which these rains and 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 uh, uh, and the torrents, uh, heavy rains, come down. So we have a lot of the names of these places, and they are. You know, it's not Dubai and Abu Dhabi or something like that. You know, there are yeah. old names of wadis and of mountains and of uh, water wells and so on, but they can be located. So uh, actually, I made a map of that, and people knew it, of course. So if you see all the dots on the map representing the places mentioned in this poetry, it falls exactly within the borders of the current uh, United Arab Emirates. Wow. And, um, but also in some of his verses, you know, he mentioned from uh, uh, Al Dhafra, which is the the, the the desert area going towards uh, Saudi Arabia, to uh, Sif al Dehan, you know, the, the coast of Dehan, which is near um, Ras al Khaimah. Mm, yeah. And he also mentioned um, the, the 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 land between the. The desert and the and the and the coast and the water the water holes in between. Uh, there is where this the, the eye can sleep in peace. Mm. Um, and, you know, then you come into a, a different part of of Ibn Zahir, and that is the oral tradition, the narrative tradition, the anecdotes about him uh, as a poet and why they like him so much. You know, and one of these episodes it goes about his it is about his search for a suitable grave. Hmm. So he goes around <laughs> the country, which is now the Emirates, looking for good soil to be buried in. So wow. he, he would bury like uh, uh, a skin, a water skin made of, of leather or something, you know. Um, or he would bury some uh, some foodstuffs and then dig them up after a year, and if he's uh, saw that it had been 
eaten by the by the worms and decayed. He said, no, this is not a good place to be buried. <laughs> Until finally, in Rasul Khaima, uh, he found everything as if he had buried it one hour ago, you know, so fresh and in the, in the clean sands. And so that's where he was buried. And I, I visited his grave there. Wow. So all these stories, you know, they, they, they tie him uh, to the identity of the country, which is, of course, very different from what it, um, uh, what, it is what it is now. You know, it was dirt poor. And, um, but a Gulf state, you know, different from Net because they also had the sea and fishing and especially yeah. pearl fishing. So there are chapters about showing him uh, as a pearl diver or as a camelier. Um, and um, his fame grew because of his poetry, which is for a large part wisdom poetry, which yeah. gives people practical rules of life. You know, it's like a manual for survival in, in life. And don't forget, it's an oral culture. You know, as Satsu Yon say, in these parts, uh, the Quran and, and the Hadith, uh, you know, they, they, are, they, are, they are not very well known because the people don't, do not read. It's an oral uh, culture and they learn by, um, from hearsay and, and tradition. So for them, the poetry and the, the, the stories are also important sources of moral Instruction. So he became very famous, and then people started flocking towards him to 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 meet him and to see what kind of person he was. Uh, and then they would come to his place, and they saw this this man who looked like you know uh, his clothes were in tatters, and he he had nothing, only a shack made of uh, palm leaves, and he was always sitting under. <laughs> A, a tree like the Buddha, huh? okay, you know, huh. reminds me of the Buddha tree, and in that his case is Al Raf. It's a tree which is the national tree of the Emirates, and he could use it for many purposes, even to feed his his camel. So they would ask him, you know, we are looking for the famous poet uh, Ibn Dahir. Well, he, he's not far away from you. Uh, <laughs> you follow the nose of your camels. You know? That's so uh, funny. Of course, the nose was pointed at at him, but they would continue and go up the hill where his shack was, try to find out the famous rich person they image. So he's also like an underdog. Uh, and it points also to a, a very important issue in his poetry that to be warned against uh, false appearances, you know, to, the, right. to uh, distinguish truths from, uh, from fake, so to speak. Right. I um, wanted to ask, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's, that's yeah, yeah. No, it's wonderful. I um, it, this all makes me think of you know being able to identify all of these places within the borders of the the current UAE, um, and and how people still think of Ibn Dahud as this sort of I guess founding cultural figure. I wanted to ask about the continued importance of Nabati poetry, and of course this will include the the show Millions Poet, which many listeners will be familiar with. In 2010, Hissa Hilal was that show's first female finalist, and she recited a poem strongly criticizing ad hoc fatwas. And you yourself, I know, have worked with Hissa and other contemporary Nabati poets. What has that process been like? And what does it tell us about the continued importance of these poetic traditions? Well, the, 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 the Millions Poet, and it's um, that's every two years. Eh? The other year is uh, Amir al-Shu'ara, mm. uh, which is in classical Arabic. Um, so it's, it's based on um, American icons. And um, it started like, as you say, 2010 or a little bit before that. So um, it shows that poetry, Navati poetry, is very much part of uh, the identity of the United Arab Emirates. And of course, yeah. we should not forget that Sheikh Zayed, uh, the father of the uh, present uh, ruler of the country, um, was a poet in his own right. And he composed in uh, Nabati poetry, and he was, you know, like a Bedouin, uh, a very tribal person, and he very attached to the customs and practices of the, of the Bedouin, uh, Aslum, as they call them, mm. you know, the, the, the desert code, the un unwritten rules of the, of the desert. And um, so that's a very different situation from 
Saudi Arabia, where it has no official recognition whatsoever. You know, it's 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 hugely possible, uh, 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 popular Nawati poetry, but of course the country itself it's it's based on um, uh, on, on on the Quran and on Islamic um, um, uh, Islamic uh, rules and doctrines. And you can already see that from the flag. So um, that stands in the way of official recognition, whereas in Abu Dhabi it's the other way around. You know, yeah. it's very much uh, encouraged. But it's wildly popular, that show. It's a te television competition. And it falls, of course, in a very ancient tradition because we also had such poet competitions in uh, uh, in the pre-Islamic period, in Oqaz, you know, in the Mu'alakat. <laughs> right. Oh, they, they were the winners uh, there. These are the oldest and uh, the earliest and most famous poetry of all Arabic literature. So that has been revived, that tradition. And the director of that um, competition, uh, Sultan Al-Amimi, is also the person who reviewed uh, my book and he's strong, strongly supportive of this translation. And um, um, Hissa Hildal, yeah, she, uh, she, she performed there and he also published her, her book, which is a very interesting one on um, Al-Talaq, you know, the yeah. repudiation, the divorce, and al the um, divorce and, and uh, separation on basis of Nabati poetry as a witness. So it's a collection of uh, poetry by, by, by Bedouin women. And it was published again in the, in the Emirates by the same, because the organization running the Millions Poets is the uh, Abu Dhabi Academy of Poetry, of which again, Sultan Amimi is the um, director, and he is the one who in 2004 published a very important book on Ibn Zahir, and he personally collected recording uh, the same way Saad Soyan and I did in Saudi Arabia from the um, people who were then also like up to in their 90s, you know, who still had yeah. lived the time before oil and um, he critically um, uh, scrutinized all the poetry to see what what could be really ascribed to Ibn Zahar and what not and he collected the oral traditions connected with Ibn Zahar and he published that and uh, so that's also one of the sources for my own publication translating that and uh, using those recordings um, so, in a way, it's comparable to, to Saad Soyan, but he's much more active in the, in the world of uh, publicity, of course, with his famous uh, shows. And also, right. uh, the Academy published enormous amounts of um, novelty poetry and studies on, on this. Finally, let's hear a passage from Ibn Dahar's Emirati oral poetry in Love, Death, Fame. This is a poem which is um, famous for its verses of uh, wisdom. And it also features the passage which I mentioned about the um, Sufi worshippers resembling uh, palm trees and dancing girls and so on. But it starts like this. It's a long poem, so I cannot um, read all of it, but I will take it from the beginning. Almighty Ibn Dahir polished his verses with finesse, elegant masterpieces spread from mouth to mouth. Poetry lovers came in throngs, flocked around me, gesticulating like market buyers and sellers. When all and sundry display dubious wares, not a single one of my fruits shows a rotten spot. Sex full of poems, succulent and tasty, Fresh dates picked with finicky care, or like sheep, grown fat on lush grazing, not a scrawny sort shunned by wolves. If you are looking for friends as company, discriminate, choose a trustworthy gentleman, not one to leave you in the lurch. He saves you with stout defense, clever tricks, helpers, in a dinghy, pitching and rolling in roaring waves on high seas. Sails reefed and jib hoisted. Evil ventures will not earn you praise. 
Noble poise on arduous climbs brings acclaim. If you've been of no use while alive, your account at death is a resounding zero. You can't escape from death's tribulations. Pleading for you on judgment day, that counts. You servile flunky, sucking up to mammon, be not beguiled. You're being led up the garden path. So you're coddled, drinking from her teats. Soon you'll be weaned, bereft of contentment. You depart from this world with a scrap, like a date sack emptied by pincers. Does it make you happy to stride into your mansion? Remember, your true abode measures an arm's length. It is natural to rejoice on returning to one's home, to be lowered into the ground, frightening. A prisoner tied down forever in a dusty grave, waiting to be released by a terrifying shout. Be wise, use your lifetime to do some good, while you can and ward off punishment. Even birds on the wing all day long must alight to spend the night. Don't you see how, our bee, how a bird needs feathers to fly? How it remains earthbound if its wings is cut? You may call for succor. God is alive and present. If you go stealing, don't think he doesn't notice. He's all-knowing, saints either plain to see or hidden. The invisible world folded into his future's chest. If God has made you well-to-do and prosperous, shame on you for being a scrunching miser. Provide for those worthy of support, widows, orphans, hearted travelers who ply the roads. Dare your gain. It doesn't hurt, even so divine decree is immutable, as bandages help to soften pain caused by wounds. A noble character stands tall, even if dressed in rags. Appearances deceive. A man is more than his trait. Right. Right. I love to end on this note of, uh, of Zohut, meaning, uh, you know, pious recollection and, and thinking about what comes after this life. Marcel, thanks so much again for coming on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you.